trading may not have been panic, but it was certainly a sell-off. The market rocked today by a falling dollar, rising trade tensions with Japan, and profit-taking. Investors unimpressed with corporate earnings, which for the most part have met and exceeded expectations. The Dow Jones Industrials tonight below 8,000 for the first time this month. Rhonda Schapler reports. Investors blackened some of Wall Street's bluest chips Thursday. Earnings reports driving a volatile and dramatic session. The Dow Jones Industrial Average finished the day down 119 points at a level of 79.38. The Nasdaq Composite Index falling nearly 24 points. This is the month of October. We're starting to see all those earnings reports and across the industries, Intel, Merck today, you know, we are seeing some disappointments and that takes a heavy price in the market. Merck paid a heavy price. The drug maker announced earnings just below expectations. Anxious investors drove shares down four and five eighths. Sears tumbled five and 13 sixteenths after warning investors that it may not reach the street's earnings estimates for the fourth quarter. Coca-Cola actually topped earnings forecast by a penny, but that wasn't enough for shareholders. Coke fell 13 sixteenths. Same story for Compaq Computer, a healthy earnings report ignored. The PC maker tumbled 4 and 5 sixteenths. And semiconductor maker LSI Logic stumbled 3. It's a market that I think over the long run is going to offer uh, normal returns going forward, 10 percent, 11 percent compound annual returns over 5 or 10 year holding period. But over the next year or so, I think there will be heightened uh, volatility. Stocks actually started the day higher, gaining 54 points in the early going. But the negative tone could well carry over into tomorrow. Late today, Goldman Sachs influential strategist Abby Joseph Cohen saying she believes the Federal Reserve is likely to raise interest rates in the coming months. Cohen, however, says a significant rise in rates is unlikely. Lou? Rhonda, you spent the day down here on this, uh, on this floor. But what was the mood here? Is there uh, rising anxiety on this floor? There appeared to be rising anxiety. Clearly, investors troubled by the fact that the market is selling off and that earnings reports aren't giving them overwhelmingly good surprises. They want these earnings to come in even better than what Wall Street was predicting. Terrific. Right to thank you. Well, contributing to today's sell-off, escalating trade tensions between the United States and Japan. As soon as tomorrow, the United States could bar Japanese cargo ships from docking in U.S. ports and detain Japanese ships already in port. The Federal Maritime Commission taking the action after several Japanese shipping companies have refused to pay $4 million in fines. This is all part of a long simmering dispute about stiff port charges levied on U.S. ships in Japan. Those talks remain deadlocked. Also deadlocked, the three-way battle for control of MCI. Bids totaling almost $80 billion are on the line. MCI announcing late today that it will meet with both GTE and WorldCom to hear them out. That is, GTE today took its case to Wall Street, pushing its all-cash bid. Alan Dodds-Frank reports. For a man not yet certain where he will raise the $28 billion to pay for MCI, GTE Chairman Charles Lee is supremely confident he can close the deal. Lee also told investors and analysts Thursday that GTE intends to include its, quote, good friend British Telecom, which owns 20% of MCI. The arguments for this merger are absolutely compelling, and that starts by its very pro-competitive nature. This brings together two great companies that are able to become the major third national player in this country in terms of a full bundle of telecommunication services. Investors may favor GTE over competing bids from WorldCom and British Telecom. Mario Gabelli owns stakes deal. in all the companies involved. What was most convincing to you about the GTE? Cash. Non-conditional. No financing. And the fact is that they will get it through the Justice Department reasonably quickly. Some antitrust experts are not so sure. Of the various propositions that are now on the table uh, with respect to MCI, this one poses the most antitrust difficulty. GTE stock tumbled more than three dollars. MCI held strong, rising almost one and a half dollars. British Telecom also rose more than a dollar. WorldCom lost less than a dollar. British Telecom's preferences certainly will carry some weight when MCI's board meets soon to consider the competing offers. Alan Dodds-Frank, CNN Financial News, New York. Major merger in Europe consummated today. Bad Industries agreeing to merge its financial services arm with Zurich Group. The market value of the resulting company, $37 billion. Bats Tobacco Division and will become an independent company, the world's largest, devoted solely to tobacco interests. 
Next on Moneyline, the bull market for business news. I'll be talking with three of the most influential editors in journalism, Norman Perlstein of Time, Steve Shepard of Business Week, and Jim Michaels of Forbes. We got a 34 minute turnaround on this one. Let's do it. It can be five below zero or coming down in buckets. It doesn't matter. It doesn't buy you another second out here. From the minute that plane touches down to the minute it takes off, we're on. I'm getting two more times on The whole crew. And there's no time to waste. But time isn't everything. Getting the job done right is. Okay, I'm locking up the line. So everybody pulls their weight. Everyone knows the drill. And we realize passengers don't really see this. Have a late bag on your way, Bob. No problem, Jerry. I'll take care of it. Heck, it's a rare moment when they see us at all. But not a second goes by that we're not looking out for them. Four seven nine are coming in eleven minutes early, Bob. At Cigna. We care about people who have babies. We care about companies that make steel. And about companies that make bread. We care about life. And about all that makes life great. Or possible. Or just better. At Cigna, we care because it is our business to care. But we also care because, well, we have babies too. Cigna. A business of caring. thousand strong the greatest names in business today united in a mission to reach ever-increasing heights of success for these world leaders one marketplace is integral to their success entrusted with the hopes and dreams of business and investors alike the New York Stock Exchange a proud part of what makes this country tick Changes at the New York Times. Arthur Oak Schulzberger today stepping down after 24 years as chairman and CEO of the company, replaced as chairman by his son, 46-year-old Arthur Schulzberger Jr. The other change, a color photo on the Times front page for the first time ever. The jubilant Cleveland Indians featured in the picture. Those changes, however, historic for the Times, dwarfed by what's been going on in financial journalism over the past decade. Whether in print or television, business news has exploded to meet demand from information-hungry investors. Greg Clarkett has the story. Before Black Monday, business news was buried in most newspapers. And TV news coverage of the street was Hawkins. scant. Jan, tell us just how bad is it? Well, Stuart, what you're looking at now is... But the stock market crash sparked a bull market in business news coverage. Because of the magnitude of the crash and the way it affected everybody and uh, investors all over the world, but particularly in the United States, I think that newspapers started redefining themselves a little and almost on the spot reinventing how they did things. Business stories muscled their way onto the front pages and new business magazines hit the newsstands at a rapid rate. There are now almost 50 business magazines, double the number in 1987. The impact on television was dramatic, too. The Financial News Network, no longer in existence, was the only channel dedicated to business news. There were no daily broadcasts from the New York Stock Exchange. Today, seven media outlets broadcast 100 times a day from inside the exchange. And a favorable change in broadcast rules encouraged cable companies to start new business channels with little expense. What we've seen actually is spin-offs to spin-offs. So CNN FN was, was created very inexpensively because it was able to leverage the infrastructure of CNN. And it's, it just seems unlikely that there will be even more business news channels. There are now three full-time business news channels, CNN's FN, CNBC, and Bloomberg Television. Business has been very good for business news, thanks to the bull market. 
But media experts now say the market is close to saturation, and they warn that the next bear market may have painful consequences, not just for investors, but for publishers and broadcasters as well. Lou? Greg, thank you very much. Well, joining me now, three of the most powerful and insightful editors in American journalism today. My guests are Norm Perlstein, editor-in-chief of Time, Steve Shepard, editor-in-chief of Business Week, and Jim Michaels, the editor of Forbes magazine. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Let me begin, if I may, Norm, uh, and cast back to, uh, to 87. How would you rate the coverage uh, by all of us, print and electronic? Um, you're specifically with regard to the crash, I think that um, the initial reaction was obviously to treat it as a big story. The percentage decline was greater than that in 1929. Um, I think with the benefit of hindsight looking back, and some of us felt so at the time, uh, the Forbes cover, and particularly Steve Forbes' very prescient piece, suggesting ways in which this might be a buying opportunity and focusing on how the small investor was seeing it that way, even as the institutions was, were bailing out, I think was really the, uh, the single strongest piece that I recall. Um, I also think that the journal piece of a month later talking about the possible meltdown on Tuesday the 20th as opposed to the, the problems of the 19th was uh, particularly significant. Norm is being uh, modest, uh, the journal winning a Pulitzer Prize for that coverage and uh, it was a, uh, one of the, the outstanding pieces. Steve, your, your thoughts on it? Well, I think in retrospect, uh, the, the press in general can probably be faulted for a little bit of overreaction. Um, that we had been conditioned, you know, the 1929 crash ushered in the Great Depression. So the natural reaction was stock market crash, uh-oh, if not a depression, at least a recession. And it didn't happen, and it proved to be a buying opportunity. And I don't think, uh, there were some isolated pieces uh, uh, that sort of suggested that. But uh, by and large, I think everyone was looking for a recession, which didn't happen in 88 or 89, didn't happen until 1991. So I think probably we got, it, we got it right. We captured the psychic tension of the moment. We probably overreacted in terms of the economic consequence, much more benign than we thought. Jim? I, I think I have a somewhat different point of view. I, at the time, I, on a television show, I said that the media was showing the greatest example of packed journalism I had seen in years at the time of the crash. Almost everybody uh, coupled the word crash with recession. Right. Um, and, but now in retrospect, I see it's even worse than packed journalism. It was the explosion of any pretense the media had that it doesn't have a strong liberal bias. When I look back at the coverage, of those times, there was a tremendous effort made to pin the crash on Ronald Reagan. Right. Time magazine wrote an article in which they said it wasn't only the market that crashed, but the Reagan illusion crashed. He had stayed on too long. When Reagan said the economy was basically sound, the New York Times had a fit and accused him of being a second Herbert Hoover. There was a total willingness, not willingness, eagerness to use this to tie Ronald Reagan. And I think that if anyone wants to do a thesis on the liberal bias of the media, they can study that period and learn a lot. Duly cautioned for our coverage now, Jim. How, would, how do you think we're prepared uh, to cover it? Uh, these uh, these markets now, whether it be a crash or not, how well do you think we're doing, well, I, gentlemen, in terms of our coverage? I guess my worry now is, if you will, that the opposite of what Jim is suggesting, and I think he cited the two most egregious examples, but they're not as representative of everybody's coverage as right. he suggests, but that notwithstanding, um, I think if there's a danger now, it is that uh, uh, serious publications are really questioning whether business cycles exist, um, are talking about 25 years of uninterrupted prosperity and so forth. And, the new uh, paradigm. And so I would say that, if anything, I'm more concerned now that um, if you got a major correction, uh, everyone would just assume that it was nothing more than that and not look for, for possible alternative scenarios. Steve? Well, of course, the economic conditions are much different now than they were 10 years ago. Uh, we have a balanced budget now, we have virtually no inflation, we have declining interest rates, we have a stronger economy, we have growing productivity. So 
uh, all of those things have to be pointed out. You can point those things out without necessarily saying the business cycle is dead. So I think that, I would hope that the coverage would be a little more realistic. And I think because we have these two models of what a crash means, I think we'll be a little more realistic. Is it better today than 10 years ago, the business coverage? journalism? Business journal, unquestionably better today. It's more global in its focus. Uh, the market coverage is more sophisticated. The technology enabling us to do the stories is better. We can do them faster. Uh, sure, I think journalism and business journalism in particular is much better than it was 10 years ago. Would you agree, Jim? I think there's certainly a lot more business journalism than there was 10 <laughs> years ago, but more isn't necessarily better, Lou. And until it happens, I'm going to hold judgment. Well, on whether it's going to be better or not better. Lou, I think one of the big changes is really in the last uh, several years, the proliferation of personal finance coverage, uh, um, both in print and uh, on television. And um, I think one of the interesting things will be to see how those publications which have not seen a bear market will react uh, should one come. Is it your instinct, Steve, that if there were to be a bear market, uh, which Norm is alluding to, that, that this would have an impact on the number of magazines, the number of uh, networks uh, and products devoted to covering Well, I think, business. you know, uh, all things being equal, it's better to live in good times than not. So I think at the margin, it will, it will stress some of the publications that are new and less established. I think the established publications will ride it out. You know, will our earnings be as good? Probably not. But it's not a threat to the established uh, publications. I don't think there's any doubt that as long as we have peace, relative peace in the world, that the demand for business journalism is going to grow. When you, when you don't have to worry about war, when you don't have to worry about uh, what the, about a Hitler coming to power or uh, the Soviet Union spilling over its borders, you concentrate on what's important to you, and that is your 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 livelihood. And the the turmoil of the 80s taught people. That there was no, that there was not a lot of security left in the world. They had to take people had to take care of themselves, and suddenly they're taking an interest in business. They're taking command of their own affairs more. They're not depending on one company to support them all their lives. And I think that that means there's got to be a continued demand for it, for more and better business journalism. Jim, thank you. I want to say thank you to each of you, Norm Perlstein, Steve Shepard, Jim Michaels, who are here tonight. Not only simply because, uh, not only because they covered the crash of '87 so very well, but because they've continued to do so over the past decade. Uh, three terrific uh, journalists and editors. Coming up next, a mystery suitor wants to buy a chain of television stations and bust up another takeover deal. That story and details of today's market plunge are next on Moneyline. Stay with us. I did everything right. Started saving early, bought stocks from one firm, mutual funds from several. I had investments, but no control. Then, I called Fidelity. Fidelity's Ultra Service account can consolidate your investments and give you control, so you can buy mutual funds, trade stocks, and manage cash in one account, on one statement, from one company. Control your investments, or they could control you. To learn more and receive an account kit, call 1-800-FIDELITY. There is an energy company that stands apart from the rest. Southern Company. We're cutting costs by 20%, saving our customers millions. And when emergencies strike, no one is more responsive. We wake up over 12 million people every day, bring energy to thousands of cities around the world, and generate more electricity than any other energy company in America. We are Southern Company. Energy to serve your world like that account I told you about. He's great. Helped out, huh? Did me a huge favor. What was that? Gave my name to his life insurance agent. Didn't do that for me. Have you heard from the quiet company? Northwestern Mutual Life. We 
have a larger percentage of our assets devoted to equities. People have lived through a series of sharp sell-offs in the market over the last few years and have tended to look at each one of those as a buying opportunity rather than a need to rush to the market and sell on a downtick. Well, a uh, decided buy opportunity today. The Dow tonight below 8,000 for the first time this month. Weaker uh, earnings than some would have liked, despite a preponderance of very strong corporate earnings reports and the prospect of a trade war uh, with Japan conspiring against the blue chips. The Dow tonight at 7938.88, a loss on the day of 119.10. Volume, more than 597.5 million shares, declining issues, beating out advancers by a 9 to 5 margin. The composite fell 4.59, the S&P 500 down 10.47. The Dow Transport's giving up 51 points, airline stocks pulling back after big gains, and the utilities rising 1.26 on a firm bond market. The Nasdaq Composite, 1699.66 today, losing almost 24 points, volume approaching 834 million shares, heavy trading. Uh, obviously, the American Exchange Composite, 708.38, down almost six points, more than 33 million shares. Tonight's money line mover, Sun Microsystems, down more than $3.25 a share. It doubled that loss in after hours trading. Earnings reported after the close, short of estimates. Applied materials plunging 10% in a downdraft among chip equipment makers. A key industry report indicating orders are weak. And Federal Mogul up $3.75 a share. The auto parts maker buying its British rival, TNN, paying almost $2.5 billion. Lynn Television, its stock up more than $4 a share. The company saying it's received a bid that's higher than the $1.7 billion offered by Hicks Muse. Lynn would name the new bidder, nor the price. Well, coming up next, a sell-off on Wall Street, trade tensions with Japan. Myron Kandel joins me next. We'll be talking about the day's big developments. Stay with us. Moneyline has been brought to you by Deloitte & Touche LLP, one of the nation's leading professional services firms. What's amazing isn't just that these companies are clients of ours but that we could go on for another 10 minutes before you saw a name you didn't recognize. For professional services, the answer is Deloitte & Touche. experience. That's the Pacific Life family of companies. Managing more than $150 billion in assets. Providing insurance and investment products for 130 years. Helping thousands of businesses and millions of individuals reach their financial goals. Use the power of the Pacific. Pacific Life. What can EDS do for a business? With EDS, a clothing manufacturer named Kelwood is raising quality and profits without raising prices. Del Monte is able to predict the perfect point to pick their peaches. And all 21 million of Taiwan citizens are now covered by health insurance. Now, what can we do for your business? EDS, a more productive way of working. It was a rough day on Wall Street. Myron Candell joins me now. Myron, let's uh, let's get your take on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, is this a you think the beginning of the correction? 
No, I don't think so, Lou. I think the market was bloodied today, but unbowed. I think there are a lot of reasons for the market to go down. Uh, that tension with Japan was a big surprise. I think that unnerved a lot of people. Well, what, what do you make of these strong corporate earnings reports? I mean, we're seeing a decided advantage to more than two to one in positive earnings surprises to disappointments. Uh, about 22% are coming in right where they expected, so it's a preponderance of good corporate news. It's not helping this market. Well, it's not helping it, and especially since the bond rally fell apart today. That was the key. The dollar weakened, bonds weakened, and the stocks uh, began to tumble. But the fact is the Dow was down 161 points with about 20 minutes but how, of how do you left. Explain, how do you explain the fact that the stronger corporate earnings are not giving lift to this market? Well, they didn't do it today. Uh, but uh, They didn't do it yesterday. They didn't do it yesterday either. That's correct. But the market is still pretty high. I think uh, we're going to see a correction, but I doubt that today's marked the beginning of it. And let's watch interest rates. Where interest rates go, if they continue down, the market continues up. Okay. Myron, thank you. Tomorrow night here on Moneyline, what was it like to cover a market meltdown? Six of my colleagues here at CNN who covered the crash of 87. Join me. Please join us as well. That's the bottom line for tonight. Good night from New York. I'm Lori Dew in Atlanta. Coming up next on Newsnight, six Marines are arrested on charges of stealing weapons and explosives. And are you getting the information you need about the weight loss plan you're on? We'll tell you in just two minutes on Newsnight. Friday on Larry King Live, shaken by the death of Princess Di, Sir David Frost on the future of the Royals, Friday 9 Eastern on CNN. Jim Reel's Roseville Chrysler Plymouth is the largest volume-selling Chrysler dealer in the country and soon to be one of the largest-selling Jeep Eagle dealers. That's right, it's now Jim Reel's Roseville Chrysler Plymouth Jeep Eagle. And with four makes and over 20 different models, we're sure to have what you want, like the Jeep Wrangler and Cherokee or Eagle Talon, plus our great selection of Chrysler and Plymouth products, including the best selection of Voyagers around. So no matter where you live, it just makes sense. Before you buy theirs, price ours at Jim Reel's Roseville Chrysler Plymouth. And now Jeep Eagle, you'll like the way we do business. I'm Geneva Williams, asking you to make a difference on Saturday, October 25th. Please join hundreds of volunteers who will make a difference by calling 1-800-392-9490 to register or for more information. We hope we can count on you. Days of Caring and Make a Difference Day are sponsored by United Way in partnership with Comcast Cable Vision and Little Caesars. something to drink? Folks, this is your captain speaking. Well, we've got a beautiful day for okay. flying. Hope everyone is enjoying Nobody wants flight. to finish second. That's why Icon Office Solutions helps you compete better. With copier systems, computer networking, and outsourcing, all designed to help your company do one thing. Win. Icon Office Solutions. Work to win. Colonial Dodge. The difference is the time they take with their customers, people just like you. Taking the time to help you find the right truck, van, or car. Taking the time to make sure you get serviced with the excellence you've come to expect. At Colonial Dodge, a family taking care of your family for 35 years. Crash it at nine and a half mile in East Point. This is CNN. It's one of the scenarios federal law enforcement authorities fear most. Lethal military hardware secretly funneled into civilian hands. Tonight, the results of Operation Long Fuse. You may think you're adequately preparing yourself for retirement, but you might be surprised to learn that chances are you're really not. And two days after the death of Harold Robbins, another well-known American author has died. Newsnight remembers one of the greats, James A. Michener.